My name is Francisco Aragon, and I direct Letras Latinas, the literary initiative at the Institute for Latino Studies. On behalf of the ILS and the Creative Writing Program, welcome to session two of Latinx Poetics, a one-day gathering. I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the Initiative on Race and Resilience, and the Department of Romance, Languages, and Literatures. A special thanks as well to the Poetry Foundation for their assistance and a shout out to Hidalmi Noriega from the Poetry Foundation who made the trip from Chicago to be with us. Gratitude as well to our private benefactors whose names are on the back of your program with a special nod to one of them who's here from Washington, D.C., Jim Wilson. That's fun. <laughs> the title of our gathering alludes to this book, which is subtitled Essays on the Art of Poetry. The poet whose work we're highlighting this evening has a piece in this collection, which was edited by Ruben Quesada. Very shortly, the current director of the ILS, Luis Fraga, will say a few words about the Institute and also introduce distinguished scholar Jose Limon, who will share his insights on Orlando Menes's work before we hear from Orlando himself. You can read about Orlando's literary trajectory in your programs as well. But first, with your indulgence, a very brief anecdote. I first heard the name Orlando Menes in a hotel bar over 20 years ago. <laughs> in the spring of 2000, the National Association of Chicana and Chicano Studies was holding its annual conference at the Hilton in downtown Portland, Oregon. Also in attendance at that conference was the founding director of the Institute for Latino Studies, Gil Cardenas. I was in my last semester as a master's student at UC Davis and when I mentioned this to Gil, over a drink, at the bar, he casually said as he handed me his card, if you think you might want to do more graduate work in creative writing, keep us in mind. We have an MFA program and a Cuban American poet on our faculty named Orlando Menes. I made a mental note returned to Davis, and was able to get my hands on this book, Rumba Atop the Stones, Orlando's first full-length book. Reading it is what persuaded me to come to Notre Dame in 2001. Please join me in welcoming to the podium, Luis Fraga. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, for those who don't know me, as Francisco just said, I'm director of the Institute for Latino Studies and uh, professor of political science. What can I tell you about the Institute for Latino Studies? Why could I, you know, I have a 25-slide PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> uh, I have it in Spanish uh, because I've given it in Spanish. But just to take a very few minutes to tell you about it, we were established in 1999. Uh, our, one of our distinguished guests, Jose Limon, was a director of the Institute for a number of years and was responsible for my coming back to Notre Dame about eight years ago. So thank you very much, Jose, for that. Um, but the Institute is, is thriving. The Institute now has uh, 36 affiliated faculty members across the university, including chemical engineering and law. We offer approximately 20 courses that are cross-listed with Latino studies every semester. 
uh, affecting in the neighborhood of around 600 students each semester. We support the research of those faculty. We provide them money for conferences and travel and to bring in guest speakers. And for our majors and minors, we offer them, we think, a very rich set of intellectual opportunities to include Latino studies as part of their undergraduate studies here at Notre Dame. We're a supplemental major and a minor. So you have a traditional major, and then you can have Latino studies as a supplemental major. And for those who graduate, we now have 90 students who are majors and minors. For when, at graduation, one hears, we ask them to write up a few paragraphs on what Latino studies has meant to their undergraduate education. And every single year, I get a tear in my eye just hearing what they say about what Latino studies meant to them. So when that happens, I know we're doing good work and all of our affiliated faculty are doing good work. Um, we, in addition to the curricular work, we have a Latino Studies Scholars Program, the only one in the country where we offer half Notre Dame tuition for students who have demonstrated an interest in and commitment to the future of Latino communities in the United States. We, in the side of our outreach work, um, helped establish a two-way Spanish-English two-way immersion program at Holy Cross School. About Some of you may have participated in that, about a mile and a half uh, down a road. We have a relationship with a community organizing, Catholic-oriented or Catholic-grounded group called the Coalition for Spiritual and Public Leadership as part of our efforts in Hispanic ministry. So we're busy. We're active. We have speakers. We um, work with our magnificent director of Letras Latinas, Francisco Aragon. Can we give Francisco a hand, please, everyone? <laughs> For all of his work, uh, Paloma Garcia Lopez, our associate director, is there. Maribel Rodriguez, where's Maribel? Is she here? She's signing a check for us. No, Maribel <laughs> is over here, our administrative coordinator. Uh, we're hiring another person that will be with us next year. So um, we are a robust and important part of intellectual life and community life here at Notre Dame. And we have every reason to think that we'll only grow in our importance here. I have the great privilege of introducing someone who I consider a dear friend someone who I consider a mentor, and someone who I know has used his time and continues to use his time to break new ground in areas of literature, in areas of cultural studies, in areas of anthropology, and that is Mr. Jose E. Limon. Now, I first met Jose when I was in high school, which he reminded me of. I was a bit of a brat then, not as smooth as I am now. And uh, Jose was there doing what it was not at all surprising to me now to learn. He was recruiting more Latino students across the state of Texas, maybe other places too, but certainly across the state of Texas. And um, Jose is a native of Texas, born, I believe, in Laredo or around Laredo, but was raised in my hometown of Corpus Christi, Texas. So he knows what a Whataburger is and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and appreciates it. And uh, one, one time for our reception, we're going to have nothing but Whataburgers um, in honor of Jose Limon. Maybe when we invite him to give another lecture, right, we'll, we'll do that. But in any case, he received all of his degrees from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he developed most of his professional career at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the Notre Dame Foundation Endowed Professor of American Literature Emeritus. He is also the Mahdi C. Boatwright Regents Professor of American and English Literature Emeritus at the University of Texas at Austin. He was also the Julian Zamora Endowed Professor in Latino Studies and the Notre Dame Foundation Endowed Professor of American Literature. So he's held a number of major, major prominent positions uh, in the course of his career. He's written many books, won many awards. Let me just conclude by telling you about a few of them. He's received the Lifetime Distinguished Scholarly Award 
from the Literature Association and the American Folklore Society's Américo Paredes Prize for his scholarship. His four books include Mexican Ballads, Chicano Poems, History of, my, my printer cut off the word, uh, History of, of what? Influence, okay, it's INF, but then it goes on. Uh, influence in American Social Poetry. He received the um, Horace uh, Prize for the University of Chicago Folklore Prize, rather, for a distinguished contribution to folklore. His second book, Dancing with the Devil, Society and Cultural Poetics in Mexican-American Texas. And if you want to see how Chicano polcas are really danced, you talk to this man. Uh, the first time we talked about that, he went like this, right? He put his hand up. I think it was his right hand up, because that's how you hold a woman. Uh, very nice and close to you. But his book, Dancing with the Devil, broke new ground and set new standards for um, what I'll call um, ethnographic cultural studies uh, here in the United States. He was the 1996 winner of the American Society, uh, the Senior Scholar Prize for Vital and Contentious Contributions to Ethnology. He also published Encounters, Greater Mexico, the United States, and the Erotics of Culture. And his most recent book is Américo Paredes. Was he your professor? Yes. What's that? Don Américo, I believe was how he was named. Um, Américo Paredes, Culture and Critique, published by the University of Texas Press. And he's edited and written, and I counted them up. He has 45 articles and book chapters um, as well. Because Jose is a dear friend, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome him back to the home of the Fighting Irish. So let's give him a Fighting Irish welcome. Well, indeed, it is good to be back. Um, but I was told that we are on a very tight time schedule, so I'm going to get right to it, if you don't mind. Otherwise, I'll go into Notre Dame anecdotes, most of which you do not want to hear anyway. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. I was asked to offer a commentary on Orlando Menes's poetry, a splendid career spanning some six major collections. I, for one, believe that one cannot talk about any poetry without offering examples of it. But in a talk, this does create the problem of having to say, quote, unquote, several times, or do air quotes, which I actually dislike intensely. <laughs> I think I would just, just rather read through what I have to say, trusting uh, that this, this audience, especially this audience, to hear the difference between my quotations of Orlando's poetry and my own rather prosaic commentary. I don't have a lot of time, so I will say only a little bit about his first two collections, Rumba Atop the, the Storms and Furia, and instead lend much more emphasis to his two middle volumes, Fetish and Heresies, leaving the most recent two, Memoria and Wildflowers and Weeds, to the interview that will follow after we finish with his reading. We're going to move over there. Well-known critics before me have characterized his first two books as ongoing explorations of mestizaje, the Latin American intermingling of indigenous, European, African, and Asian culture. These critics also said Menes's body of work is significant because of his distinctive poetic voice and his unusually broad and deep engagement with religion and myth, an engagement also dense with bot botanical and zoological description. His poetic not technique, they continue, is clearly affected by recent heteroglossic approaches and a tightly controlled balance between his training in classical forms and his appropriation of Latin rhythms and colloquialisms. 
Menes maintains but richly extends all of these characteristics in his next two prize-winning collections, Fetish, 2013, and Heresies, 2015. While still broadly engaged with Latin America, Fetish takes us more explicitly to his native Cuban experience, but also towards his current home in South Bend and toward family life of, as well as the life of labor and politics, which is also to say to the United States, but also to Castro's Cuba as he explores the poetic uses of ordinary language. For any sensitive Cuban-American coming to maturity in the second half of the 20th century, Cuba is always at issue. Although for the most sensitive and intellectual, such as Menes, this issue is not easily resolved. And his fine verse captures the complication offering a nuanced management of the seeming antithesis between poetry and politics. Thus, the first poem in the collection Courtyard of Close Lines on Angel Hill immediately situates us in Castro's Cuba as it evaluates the revolution and its relation to the common people of Cuba. The poem opens with rain that seems to beckon on the far horizon, but only to remind the speaker that, quote, the long drought has made fresh water as scarce as milk or gasoline. And in a fittingly prosaic rendering of, of the aftermath of the much heralded revolution. Under such prosaic conditions, the people in this poem struggle as the language heightens. Thus, women churn clothes in boiled seawater to then hang in a compelling simultaneous assonance and alliteration, excuse me, on sasal lines that crisscrot the stone courtyard like a cat's cradle, only to then have wayward gusts wreck the frazzled rope, such that, like those common people themselves, a darn diaper or threadbare blouse are tossed like some injured bird astray in Excuse me, my glasses would slide every so often, and I'll, and there went the reading. In cumuli that send Caribbean, that's sent to Caribbean shores. My two quick metaphorical equivalents of clothes and people is then acknowledged, but Menace wisely rejects it because while clothes can be replaced by barter or theft, these kin lost at sea are grieved in shrines of patched photos, fading and gender remembrances of desperate men and women called escoria or scum by the government, who take to the Florida Straits on rafts stitched from boards, wire mesh, inner tubes, refugees fleeing Cu Castro's non-religious Cuba, who, with all of the speaker's human sympathies, clamor to Maria or Yamaya for sweet water as they plunge into the waves when angels whisper from the brine. As Christopher Merrill, Christopher Merrill has noted, in this poem and throughout his work, Menes renders the invisible world in images that scar the imagination, that unsettle certainties, that plumb the depths of the soul. For Menes, Cuba is the place of sacrifice, of a social crucifixion of his fellow Cubans and indirectly of himself. As in the next poem, Golgotha, with its striking learned reference to the place of Christ's crucifixion and not merely cavalry, which he now transposes to the island as my Golgotha. Mi Golgotha, even as he translates to remind us of his first language, Spanish. But even more specifically, of his native homeland. That Caribbean Catholicism, by the way, is no simple matter. The title poem, Fetish, powerfully invokes Santeria and the placement of its central and highly aestheticized symbol or fetish. An elega that the poet sees place with Our Lady of Regla Church as he visits Cuba 
as a mature adult. But as its most powerful fetish in Santeria, the Elegua seems to stand for the island itself, as the speaker poet imagines taking it and the island back to very un-Cuban South Bend. I crave to take you home, says the speaker, where snow and hail fall from brittle clouds that phosphorus the, the night sky. The poem called Mambo, set in old Havana's Catedral, continues this fruitful tactic of suffusing the religious with the sumptuousness of nature, but now also adds erotic music and dance. Stone shrines are bathed in aquarelles of avocado, papaya, and grapefruit, even as from stained glass cages, while carmelites, mambo, and swirl on altars of sugar skulls, rum tongues, trill conga canticles. This wonderfully, oh, by the way, in case anybody out there doesn't know it, carmelites, of course, are nuns. Okay. This wonderfully outrageous coupling of sacred and profane continues in the poem Maracas of Rain, where, quote, mass is sumptuous when passion buds bloom, the Eucharist cha-cha-cha on brown sugar sands. But in matters Cuban, from Spanish rule to the present, such an ecstatic absorption with religion and the poetics of a fecund nature and erotic music sooner than later must return to the poetics of politics, as we saw in the very first poem, Courtyard of Close Lines. Menes is not at all unaware of the Fulgencio Batista oppression of pure Cubans that led to the Fidelista revolution of the 1950s and the eventual takeover of Castro. In Abad, the, I don't know if I pronounced that right, Abad, the, char, the charcoal makers, we meet the patrician Don Ramon, who produces charcoal and pays his poor workers with credit slips that have wet sugar, hard bacalao, oh lard, while he boasts he can eat three chickens at a sitting ramrod fist to make good on threats. Yet, the speaker warns, the revolution is coming, Don Ramon. On the other political hand, in a later Cuba under Castro in the poem, Spider-Man Comes to Havana, he continues with fowl, chickens, as a social signifier, in this case, turkeys, presented with a nicely done Thanksgiving butterball turkey, no doubt painfully and patiently uh, procured on the black market, a Cuban family will rise and holler in awe, while such a succulent bird might not stir Americans to much noise. Americans whose government has embargoed Cuba. In the end, Castro, who promised so much, gets the poetic worst of it. In The Maximum Leader Addresses His Nation, the poet, now ironically recalling his earlier themes of Cuban nature and expressive culture, in a prose poem, parodies the unchecked verbosity of a Castro speech, who, looking toward a future modern Soviet-style socialism, exhorts the following, cut down the palms, my countrymen, raise the mangoes, uproot the papaya trees, let barbed wire's brambles cover our valleys, because life is not a carnival, but a wake of reason. You will not tell spicy jokes. You will not play dominoes or gyrate to drums. Whoever faints or complains will be shot on sight. And the Catholic faith also returns as a religious critique of Castro's repressive and secular rule. In Den of the Lioness, a former Castro guerrilla fighter, a former female Castro guerrilla fighter is now in prison for some party line deviation and is tortured, yet 
this woman kept saying, tending God's creatures like St. Francis at Assisi, a lame rat one night, a pregnant mouse another, a croaking frog, a chirping cricket. The failed outcomes of Castro's regime are also experienced at ground level in the everyday existence of Cubans that the poet sees in Cuba as a mature adult. Ordinary people must get by and improvise in the face of shortages. Thus, in refrigeradoras, as the poet refrigerators, as the poet himself now improvises in a more quotidian, yet still poetically engaging diction and rhythm. Our genius, he says, is el invento, the quick jury rig fix. We bring back to life geriatric ice boxes, pre Castro's General Electric, Frigidaires, and Westinghouses with scavenged parts, filled spurs, junked thingamajigs. We are a people who make miracles with dogged craft, with the found tool. To his aunt, the speaker brings a fat pork brought, bought from a butcher pushing a broken bicycle, and I give her $20, press the bill into her hand, and tell her that the family in Miami will write soon, and then not wishing to stay for a dinner made from pig guts like eels in brine, he leaves. I leave. I, the bearer of dollars, the bearer of false promises. For there are, of course, also displaced Cubans in the United States, and these too have their own quotidian lives of getting by, also articulated in his now more grounded diction and rhythms. In Tia Gladys, backroom seamstress, the poet's aunt, quote, threads past, pedals, runs the feed dogs to stretch waist, sew buttons, hem cuffs, seam crutches. In parallel fashion, Arts Poetica tells of a father who placed leftover lumber, groomed the grain with emery rags, ripped shards, buffed truck to suede, every nick and scratch, then smeared with an oily stain, while the speaker, working alongside his father, quote, gave succor to fractures, restored scraps, healed the wart on a fractured leg as it buckled the austere lithe. Thus, under the title Ars Poetica, the crafting of wood wonderfully conjoins with the crafting of poetry. This is likely the same father in Windfall Antiques who mends houses of refugees and looks out for old furniture, Windfall Antiques. The speaker says, to fix with mallet, strainer, needle, twine, and chalk. Even as the father also introduces him to culture conflict in the United States, saying, waste, you know, is for gringos. Such conflict looms large in the poem Horses, as another speaker finds himself in a Miami military school taunted and abused by an oppressive gringo upperclassman until one night a yank Lewin from the top bunk and with eyes taut, teeth biting tongue, I pelt, kick, scratch, till belly fat bloats the nails quick the trot reel and reel out my Spanish curses. Even as he identifies with the freedom of the strong horses that he hears outside the barracks, trampling through the treeless ground, hooves that rip concrete as in the silt of rivers. The, t the theme of cultural conflict in the United States continues in Sal and television and in a patient teacher where the poets, where the speaker re recounts the social pressure on his native Spanish, which he resists. He says, I free write in Espanol, squelching any intrusion by Lord English. But then 
a new theme, his family takes over the next nine poems, really sonnets. El Cristo de Piedra is a beautiful and moving testament to his Catholic faith and to life. The speaker and his wife cannot conceive a child, and on a trip to Cuba, he visits a pilgrimage site where a rock fist Christ sprawls on a skew cross. I caress his ochre heart, pray to have a child. I scratch the ground for a sign, but only dig up a few termites dress the husk. The couple decides to adopt a Panamanian girl, certain that Ibis could not conceive. But in a few days, she, the speaker's wife, calls me at work with the good news that she is pregnant, God's miracle. Or was it vagrant chance that made the play, says the speaker, either way, Faith is deep water that wears away the rocks of reason, washes out silt of creed, unstable, profligate, resistant to doubt's gravity. The baby arrives in the poem Birthing Adrian. He is all bruised up as if hit by a truck going ninety, but holding our baby, I could make out his plug nose, puckered mouth, thrilled he was intact. Alive, no sonogram blur, a fetus or fetus brooding in a sack, a baby soon a toddler in, a po in the poem called Tantrums, and the new dad is enraged with but trembles, my nerves flayed raw. But, he breathes, I stop, saved by the angel of guilt, because love's not frail, but tensel, resistant to grudges, set in spring as I hush and I dance him in my arms, bent to his law. But in Braille, we meet, meet the other adopted child, Valerie, three years old, newly parented, abused by her Dominican birth mother, Valerie, who, quote, will fly to America, but only when unleashed by a judge requiring a Sony laptop and a video for his permission. Call it a donation, says the poet. Call it a bribe. At home in America, the speaker, fighting sleep, will walk into the room, Valerie in Dora pajamas, pink slippers, and, quote, her small hands do not fumble or paw in the faint light, but linger over my face as if bumps bristles and pits were braille. Later in another, in the only one of his poems, as far as I can tell, set on the Notre Dame campus, Valerie runs into the grotto and father and daughter will feed the money box, light candles, kneel in the spring air as the little girl prays, mother of God, help me not break things, help me be good and not litter. Diagnosed with ADHD, the father gives her Adderall. The, the next poem's title, Against the Advice of Zealots Who Say Disorder is Divine and Needs No Cure. He's sure he is making the wiser choice as he invites us to, quote, watch Valerie make sun rays with candy foil, glue castles from wood scraps, <laughs> swirl sand into butterflies. And the other child, Adrian, returns in the poem, St. Joseph River, which compared to the Amazon, where this poet has been, is by, med by comparison, an overgrown brook, servile to industry, timid flutter, and flows that skein in shimmers. From a bridge across the river, Adrian feeds the grease, but one day he slips, yet, says the speaker, I, quick enough, thank God to catch him before the plank's edge. From the everyday life of father, son, and a shallow river, we are then moved from seemingly surface descriptiveness to philosophical religious depth, depth on a par with Robert Frost. Late by one second, says the speaker, would tragedy's door have burst open, the floor of normalcy 
caving Job would laugh at such a thing. Like moths, he said, we hover over chaos, our lifeline a silk string. These lines also serve to illustrate a former element that the poet is using in these family poems that he has not fully employed elsewhere, which is the use simply of traditional rhyming, door, floor, thing, string, the kind of rhymes that also appear in the other poems in this family section, almost as if by marking these poems in this very traditional way, he invites us to see this family world in Little South Bend as every bit as poetic and therefore as serious as the rest of his Latin America, a subject that he will return to in the, in the remaining poems in, in fetish, which formally and thematically closely resemble this previous work, but with the possibility that such previous though marvelous work may also inadvertently created a fetishized Latin America for his readers with his fecundity of nature and, uh, and religion. He, it's as if he is working against this possibility because he then, in this poem, demystifies it with lines such as this one that reminds, us, reminds me, at least, of the devil and commodity fetishism by anthropologist Michael Tosic, who a famous work about mining in Bolivia. Says the speaker, the mountain eats men alive by 46 silicosis, tuberculosis, a kid's life shorter, cave-ins, gas, dynamite. Yet God cannot reach deep inside the mine. So there one must praise the devil. Such demystification is wonderfully and paradoxically continued in his second prize-winning forthcoming collection, Heresies. Here, however, the rich heightened diction, rhythm, and phrasing returns, as does his intense engagement with religion and myth, although now in the name of a deep heresy. As Susan McCabe says, Menace's language is dense, baroque, torqued, suiting the poet's aesthetics of prayer and incantation. Menace appends, upends, excuse me, the usual traditional forms of Catholic Christianity by stressing the intersection of the sacred with the profane, such that the profane now becomes paradoxically and democratically religious. Even the form of most of these poems is heretical in the sense that most are short prose poems for forsaking the traditional stanzaic form. Thus, for example, Cenobites invites us to consider our usual sense of the Cenobic as a calm and continual com communal mon monkish existence in favor of Cenobites who, quote, dredge mangrove catacombs and rumba to la mea culpa. A senrustica is presented as the patroness of tobacco growers, and she puts on a corona, puffs on a corona, excuse me, preaches the plant's sacrament, tobacco plants whose tender shoots swaddle baby Jesus. The poet then shifts his tomatic focus to the enslavement of Africans. Saint Lazarus is no longer an old white leper whose image we habitually see engraved in paper or baked into porcelain. He is instead now refigured as a powerful ebony figure in strength and color, an African leader who dares to ask, where was Jesus to raise the dead in this coffin with sails? In similar fashion, an imprisoned leader of the Haitian slave, revolt, slave revolts is refashioned as Christ and ask God, why do you forsake me, Father? Am I not your rightful son, black as the tar on your holy fire? Other poems continue the heresy in more fundamental religious terms. The Caribbean is imagined as a new and more vibrant Jerusalem. Saint Primitivo exhorts us 
to not pray for favors kneeling on little stones or scribbling. Faith demands a more primal heart. Against those who crucified Jesus, a son Longinus says, may the Lord's donkey break wind in your face. And I am the warrior who slings leaden olives into your eyes. Throughout this collection, we see Catholic Christianity, but through paradox and inversion, through a framed, through a, excuse me, through a truly incarnated word, capital W, perhaps reaching its climax in nine benedictions for the Middle Ages. That high chronological point of Christianity, the Middle Ages, is now envisioned as, quote, holy your rosaries of carried teeth, and holy your alms of, alms of marrow, which, of course, now with this more committed Im immersion into religion and Catholicism, then brings us to his more recent work, Wildflowers and Weeds, from which I with from which I think Orlando will be reading to us this evening. Orlando Menes is a wholly accomplished poet with a now substantial body of work that compares favorably with that of any American poet, living or dead, in its artistry and its intelligence, a work also deeply informed by wide and profound reading and scholarship. Unlike most American poets, however, he spans North and South America and is in fluent command of its two major languages. In the United States, only William Carlos Williams comes close to Menace's nuanced intercultural American sensibility. As such, he is now, I want to believe, a central figure in this group that gathers here at Notre Dame. May I take the license to say that gathers here at La Universidad de Nuestra Señora. I think it wholly appropriate that he was given a special forum for this gathering and I'm especially grateful and honored that I, not a poet, was invited to be a part of it. Muchas gracias. You do such honor to me, sir, and I'm very appreciative. I'm beyond words, and I love words, but maybe right now I don't have the right words. Um, and uh, I, I have never had anyone thread all these poems together into an analysis, especially that, you know, I mean, I just wrote them one by one. I wasn't thinking of them necessarily together. That's why I get paid the big bucks. <laughs> so, um, and, and uh, it, it shows me how consistent the language of my poetry is throughout all these books. And we'll talk more about this. Um, thank you so much, sir. And thank you all for being here. It, it really does me an honor. OK. Anyway. Um, I'm not a very emotional person, but I'm feeling emotional now. So if you will, please bear with me. Um, yes, I, I, I am going to read this first poem, The Blackberry Tree. Uh, uh, some students mentioned it, and, and um, they, they really like it, and that's, that's good. Um, and uh, well, I, I want to say I was born in Lima, Peru to Cuban parents and I lived there until I was 10. That was a long time ago, okay? I, I left in 68. I don't have any personal familial connection to this country beyond just the fact that I, was, that I lived there. But it really got into my head. These memories I cannot disconnect from at all even though, again, I have no familial connection to this place, um, it is a contradiction. 
And I live with contradictions as a poet all the time, and Jose's introduction made this very clear. So um, we lived in a, in a chalet. That's the, the word the Peruvians used, uh, a house, a one-story house, uh, next to a vacant lot. Now, I don't remember who owned that lot, uh, why there was no house on that lot. I don't know that. But there was a family, an indigenous family, taking care of the lot. And, you know, most Peruvians who are indigenous are from the Andes. And these are Andean, these were Andean people. And so in Peru, I, in Lima, I grew up with these Andean people. Um, and, um, well, they made Lima what it is uh, beyond its claims to European culture. So, and the Andean foothills that this poem references were behind the house. Uh, so these are, so, so the poem makes reference to the Andean foothills and to Quechua culture, but also to Catholicism. The blackberry tree. We had bananas that bore no fruit. An old macaw stooped on a weathered cross and a blackberry tree that grew next to a wall crowned with broken bottles. The Andes foothills crumbled on a gravel path. The desert sun broke through the cloak of winter. I must have been eight or nine when I climbed that tree to its highest branch and saw over the jags of glass a bare woman bathing in a brown field her quick hand splashing water from an oil barrel, rubbing hard with a brick of laundry soap until skin glistened to that newborn bronze before the ravages of Patna. She did not sing, but whistled a tune like a reed, as if Puna winds were grazing Ichu grass to size of rosary. A toddler ran to her, and she heaved the crying child to her waist, then walked, still wet, to a zinc hut by a corn patch, burnt to stubbled ash. I climbed down fast and almost sprained my ankle. At mass in the Church of Nazarenes, I had seen women feed their bundled babies, babies with breasts exposed. And Mama would pull my lobe, telling me to think of Mary nursing baby Jesus with a shawl of bristly wool as modesty demands. Our priest taught that flesh is the parchment of sin, and God's suckling grace can be lost by the smallest transgressions in this world where goodness fails to root against the weed. Fifty years on, I now know that his law slants to love, and I will not eat their bread of shame leavened with fear. On that blackberry tree, my eyes saw divine beauty, simple, coarse, naked, this gift of light lifting the fog of humanness. Uh, the next poem is entitled Grace, and grace, the word, is all over my poetry. Even now that I'm writing a new book, grace is everywhere. Um, I'm very Catholic, but I'm not politically Catholic. That's the thing. I'm privately Catholic, but that's it. My Catholicism exists in the poems. That's all. Grace. We cannot buy it in bulk at Trader Joe's, swap it for gold or hoard shares of Grace Incorporated to hedge against bad luck. We acquire it without contract, promissory notes, or IOUs, neither codicils nor fine print. We gather Grace safe from litigation or severance. And though we might breach the strictures of creed, 
it cannot be forfeited or suspended. Rather, grace is asymmetric, parabolic, skewed to love, imminent and absolute, but also unpredictable as quantum particles, both here and there, both full and empty. So it might arrive inopportunely and thus slip under hope, upsetting the earnest prayer, teasing our faith, like some rain bands, copious cumuli, that appear astray, unbidden in stagnant skies, to drench at last the drought scourged earth. Um, this, this poem is very much about words. It's called the Tower of Babel. You know all, you know the Babel story. Uh, this poem has had some resonance with readers. Uh, this scholar wrote an essay in which she discussed the poem. Um, and uh, in Germany, this church is performing this poem along with other poems about Babel, the Tower of Babel. So, uh, whatever. <laughs> the Germans are into it. <laughs> yeah. Tower of Babel. Praise be to God for confounding our tongues and scattering us, scattering us into exile like chaff in a stray wind or the fig seeds dropped by a green iguaca on a hug plum. Confusion is sweetest chirimoya on a dry tongue. Hymns of disorder bring bountiful harvests in times of drought. And perhaps only cross eyes can see in chaos serene mandalas. I shout from the top of my Babel's tower, sown as a kapok tree. Blessed are the dialects, the patois, the argos, and the pigeons, the half-breed word hordes and the mongrel grammars, the geechis, the galos, and the ghost words, those hallowed languages gone dead or worse, extinct because of genocide or conquest or just time's erosion. Yet how we must mourn each one in our bones, hearts, spleens. Then join hands by the sea at dawn to chant their names in flames of gumbo limbo. Oh, so many to remember. El molo mawa bashu, koibal, guanche, kalusa, wichita, and the taino of my own island, Guanacan, whose words linger past the cyclones of our sadness, like flotsam chromosomes or castaway fossils of such beautiful amber as barbacoa, canoa, fotuto, amaca, iguana, malanga, tabaco, yuca. With these words, I make machines of memory in flesh and marrow. With these words, I glide and cleave the tidal waves of history. With these words, I take root in the quicksands of diaspora. OK, um, next poem is going to be based on a painting. Um, could I have water? I'm really <laughs> thirsty. Uh, I, I'm sorry to ask for this, but. The old, uh, you know, windpipe isn't doing very well. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there's the painting. It's a painting by the Cuban um, artist Carlo Henrique, who um, was part of the movement in Cuba called La Vanguardia, the avant-garde uh, painters. And there were, you know, a number of them. And my book um, concerns uh, many of these uh, works of art by these painters, including um, Wifredo Lam, who is, uh, you know, much better known than Carlo Enrique. Uh, and this uh, painting is called Landscape with Horses. And it was uh, painted in 1941. 
just almost, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, but there we go. And this poem is titled Trip Triptych Number no. 2, Carlos Enrique, and, but it's subtitled Yeguas, which in Spanish means mayors. Yegua is mayor. Um, in conversation with Enrique's 1941 painting Landscape with Horses. Seaborne winds whirl into conchineal skies, unravel a garland of sweet sop clouds, roar into ramshackle hills that breed the Anepheles in the pearl-eyed boa, thrashing a clutch of royal palms, tall, slender, and wind-whittled as your own brushes of pig's bristle weasel's hair. Those round, flat, and bright pinceles you wield like a bone wand, palo de brujo, priests aspergies. O carib, o carib caduceus that blesses our cyclone prone island with embroideries of bush, weed, and sprout, filigrees of the epiphyte and the strangler fig, veneers of mold, moss, and mildew. Ay, pintor de la tierra, how well you knew in your cassava bones and soursop heart that to be pure and sovereign, our island must be reborn as Guanacan, when humans brewed prophecies of cooba, hovered like hummingbirds atop purple canopies, rode the hammerhead shark on a full moon. I swim your river of green lightning that splits apart the green meadow of foragers, and I smell, hear, see a herd of wild horses, lithe and skinny as the palms behind them, delicate in their stride, unwary of any swerve of wind. Some of the mares among them, drinking from the river, the slow, dense water, Molasses of mercury that slides down swales of cinnabar muck where I crawl like a mudfish, roll down the riverbank, swallowing this dough of clotted earth. And as the glowworms burst into flame, I realize these yeguas are my brethren, my blood, my very breath. So then, like Adam, who named the animals, I unchristened them for all eternity, uttering just neighs and whinnies, spiting the saddle to the bit rain stirrups, and with savage gait, I am free to run alongside for a hundred leagues, days on end, never out of breath or hampered in stride, stubborn on instinct, our destiny not a dwelling or a homestead but a horizon of burnt emerald where the angels of the hurricane tremble the cotton silk trees. <laughs> well, that was, that was intense, huh? <laughs> yeah, that, my middle name should not be Ricardo, but Intenso. <laughs> Orlando Intenso. Orlando Furioso. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm shifting now to my two last uh, poems. Uh, this, this, uh, this one is kind of a, kind of a weird son, uh, poem. It's a prose poem, and it's a dramatic monologue in the voice of the Minotaur. I'm, I'm fascinated by these weird creatures, you know, and what they have to say about being alive. And, uh, okay, so here's what the Minotaur has to say about being, being a Minotaur. <laughs> Minotaur, isn't the bat birdier than a penguin, the whale fishier than an eel? And doesn't the platypus lay eggs and the hammerhead shark bear live young? There's no logic to creation. When a random sperm wiggles into the wrong womb, monsters like me are made. I am the impossible hybrid. The mule has nothing on me. Every morning I ask myself, should I be a man or an animal today? 
I can compose dithrams to the dew of the moon, then just as fast gore a man's skull like a mongongo nut. You men of reason call me an abomination. Confusion is in your blood, you say. Go live with the beasts of the field and the anthropophagi and the, and the cannibals too. Watch me crash through your labyrinths of caste. Watch me tear up your cultivars of culture. I am the, the apostle of impurity, the insider of instinct, the confounder of nature. Hear me, my half-beast brothers, my multitudes of the half-bred and the ill-bred. It is our destiny to transgress biology. Let balance surrender to flux. Let chaos overrun God's handiwork. Join me in my crusade to break the curse of wholeness. Scatter rigid symmetries. Untune all harmonies. Those fractious fractions of our blood will be our legacy. <laughs> That's a messed up minotaur. Huh? <laughs> I love I love everything that's messed up. I love everything that's contrarian. Yeah, that's why I love Blake so much, William Blake, because he's a contrarian. Yeah, he's my apostle over in English. <laughs> yeah, good old William Blake. Uh, okay, so anyway, this is uh, a sonnet, but it's a non-sonnet, which doesn't follow a traditional pattern, so it's kind of a messed up unruly sonnet. Okay, so, um, and uh, it uses language I don't normally use, so that's just a caution there. Uh, Non-sonnet for Rousseau. Why spray to death the poison oak that cracks my mildewed fence, or pull the crabgrass thriving in the ball patches of my lawn? Yard work is effed up, the sex pistols sing. Let anarchy reign, decay is a natural thing. Praise rot wood, leaf mold, red rust, fungal spawn. Implore the worm, the termite, and the mole. O oh, prophet Rousseau, talk to me of soul. How free it is without law, caste, or creed. I want to be savage and eat bark of trees, drink green water, crawl rocks to cut my knees. Purge me of words, abstractions, the screed of reason, logic's bane. Bless me, I, beast, mammal, runt, grunt, enchanter, Mux Priest. Thank you. for the technician is okay good okay okay the way that I understand this is this is going to be a free-flowing interview but I'm afraid I must read a little bit because I have a complicated question for this very complicated man yeah. <laughs> messed up <laughs> Lendo first of all thank you for your your wonderful reading mostly from your in fact, all of it from your 2022 collection, Wildflowers and Weeds. As it happens, by the way, this, uh, the, w this book, Wildflowers and Weeds, was published by the University of New Mexico Press, which, as it happens, 
also published the volume Latinx Poetics, which is at the center of this, of this gathering. And for that, by the way, I should note that we must somehow in this gathering issue a, a, a thanks to the University of New Mexico Press for its commitment to poetry and to Latino poetry. I think we often forget about the role of presses in all of this. And so we want to thank them and especially the series editor, uh, Hilda Raz. As it happens, Orlando, you also, you also have an essay in Latinx poet poetics, where you write, quote, that writing poetry for you is a devotional act, a quest for transcendence, a craving for grace, obviously a religiously inflected statement, further affirmed later in the essay, where you speak of poetry, quote, as a liturgical experience, a questing for grace in our fallen world. In the time that we, you have, I want to see if we can elaborate on what seems to me to be this central question for you. The word on the street, by the way, is that I am writing a comprehensive essay on your work <laughs> for a possible publication, a part of which indeed I read this evening. So I was hoping that you could kind of help me out by, <laughs> by responding to a kind of a working thesis and argument for that essay which is that wildflower and weeds is, for now anyway, that most complete act of poetic transcendence that you have been seeking, of affirmation of grace, especially relative to where you began in your poetic youth, with poetry that in that very same essay you describe as minimalist, both in its language, but perhaps therefore also minimalist in its effort to transcend. So what is my point here? That while flowering and weeds, if we take Orlando at his word, and I suggest that we do, then this search for poetry as a religious affirmation, as a liturgical experience, we're there now. Now, we may go even further, but we are certainly there with wildflowers and weeds. And for me, that's a long ways from where we began in minimalism. In between, though, there is the other poetry, that poetry of the fecundity of nature, of the affirmation of Latinidad in so many, in so many of the poems. And the two go hand in hand. Nature as fecundity becomes a kind of a signifier of Latinidad in its own way. There is also, of course, the political critique, particularly of Castro's Cuba, that we must also need to deal with as Latinos, and not just Cubans, by the way. All of us need to deal with, especially someone my age who, at the moment of the Cuban Revolution, was going like this and then gradually went like this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. But I'm now thinking, I and mean, this is the question I would now ask, whether that middle stage was already, in a way, its own transcendence from the minimalism. It's pushing us to a different awareness of the world. Indeed, a more uh, open awareness of the world, centered still in nature and centered still, though, however, in Latinidad, that middle period. But now we have wildflowers and weeds. And when I read that, that book, and I read it very, very carefully, I sense a, com dare I say, a complete transcendence. We are now in another spiritual, religious space with that book. And so my question now is, does that also mean that in reaching wildflowers and weeds, we have also transcended that middle stage of Latinidad? which need not be wrong or right. It's simply the permission, the allowance that we give to a poet who is expanding his or her range. The middle stage, wildflowers and weeds, are we now in a different and perhaps more traditionally recognized moment of religious transcendence, which of course implied in all of this is of course what you refer to as your 
like mine, your strange Catholicism <laughs> as well. Am I, is the question at least somewhat mm. clear? Maybe I can, I can clarify if not. <laughs> or a Whataburger. <laughs> uh, yeah. Our motif for the night, by the way. Hmm. So, um, wow. I, I'm, I'm just so, I don't know. I mean, I've never gotten this much attention <laughs> <laughs> in my life as a poet. I mean, I want to say this. I'm so thankful for it. You know, I mean, what can I say? You know, uh, maybe I should just walk away and keep that in mind. You know, and just oh wow, <laughs> and you know, I might you know misstep or something. Uh, um, God, yeah, I. Uh, I I think that you you got to something in in your last. In your question, you didn't read the last part that you wrote. Oh, um, I was trying to keep it short here. Yeah, but but I I I, I think that yeah I, I think as as a person, I'm always. Uh, shall I shall I add the rest? Oh, I mean, there there is a struggle. There is an agonistic relationship between the sacred and the profane the spiritual and the earthly. You know, the, the ideal and the everyday. You know, like, um, and, and it's that contradiction, it's that tension that keeps me interested. Mm -hmm. But it's also in writing poems, you know, it's like, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, writing a poem, I mean, sure, it's easy. I mean, you can just sit down and fill up, you know, 12 lines with words. I mean, it's, it's, it's not so hard to do. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's work to sacrifice yourself mentally and emotionally for the poem. I mean, it's like, I'm, I mean, I always enter a poem not knowing. I don't know. And so I've got this poem that I just finished called Vocation. Uh, it, and it begins with, I do not write what I think, but think what I write. And that's the way my mind operates. Like, I mean, if you ask me, you know, all sorts of, you know, ask me all sorts of questions about the world and ideas, etc. cetera. You're, you're never gonna hear the Orlando in a poem mm. because it only happens when I'm writing the poem, when I'm sitting in front of that screen or that piece of paper or whatever. Uh, so the act of writing for me is the act of thinking, the act of believing, the act of prayer. The act of? Prayer. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not in, a, not in a conventional sense, you know, as in, well, you know, there are the, all these words to say and that's it, you know, like when I was taught, you know, for my first communion, you know, I was taught to memorize the creed, the creo, you know, I mean, this was 1967. Uh, I, I don't think the Vatican Council II had really made an impact in Lima, I, I don't remember that happening. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's you, you. You mentioned that I'm, I'm <laughs> this very Catholic poet who doesn't even go to mass. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm gonna interrupt with a question because if we start asking another one, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Isn't that what prayer is? Isn't prayer the collapse? All right. Rather than the antagonistic well, or opposite. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I ne never really thought about it that way. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you did. I mean, I, I, I don't know how that would fit into my own mind. 
because my own mind is, is a mind of conflict. And my, my head is all full of conflict all the time. Um, I mean, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but, but you know, it, it's, and, and so why is all this language of devotion of the sacred so present in these poems that I write? Well, so present, especially in this last yeah, volume yeah. that you write. Yeah, wait, the heck is that? You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, at a Catholic university, sure. I mean, I mean that, you know, that doesn't, you know, click here. Um, you know, when, when uh, I mean, it, it's not the in institutional church that inspires me. It's the folk religion. It's the language of the sacraments. It, it is the devo It is the ritualistic aspects of the faith. No, I must. I must argue only a bit. That is, okay. it is not. not and, and the other word on the street is I'm supposed to be a folklorist. All right. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no. But the, the 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 images you use in this particular last volume mm -hmm. are so traditionally Christian. Yes, they are. Yeah. No, yeah, it's I not know, folk. Yeah. Yeah, I know. No, I know. no, 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 Okay, it's not folk. <laughs> it's yeah, you, yeah, you've yeah, turned yeah, yeah. to the most canonical yes, yes, yeah, representations right. of Catholicism, and I just right. want to know what is that about? I mean, I was so happy with mangoes mm. and papayas, and you know, and then whoa! Please define for us what is prayer and what is transcendence. Those are good questions. Orlando, yes, oh. <laughs> Well, prayer is, prayer first has to come out of humility, you know, and it's a reaching out to the divine from a point of humility and of surrender. And, and I think that's what we do when we write poems, if we, you know, are really dedicated to them is that we must surrender to the poem. And, and how, and this is something that is very important to a poet like Wordsworth, is how the imagination can alter memory. Yes. The imagination must be invoked in a poem, or else you end up just with an anecdote. You know, I mean, what historians, you know, can write, you know, I mean, it, it's the imagination. And the imagination, unfortunately, has a way of altering what happened. You know, the facts, let's say, of a memory for the sake of the poem. Because you must always surrender to the poem, you know, and if, and if there's someone who says, well, you know, I want your poems to be verified by, you know, the people, you know, in the event that happened, it's like, oh, come on, give me a break, you know. It, it, it's, it's, this is not nonfiction. I'm not writing nonfiction. I'm writing a poem. A poem is an artifact, you know. Uh, there, there's no contract between, I don't think, the poet and the poem or the reader that says, you know, uh, yeah, I can't conflate it two people in one person in a poem. You can't do that because these two people are different. But the imagination demands that they be conflated because they speak uh, the truth better as you understand it. Yeah. It, it, if I could ask you, if it's open. Uh, what, what, it uh, seems to be now. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you talk about the role form plays then in that um, in that activity and in that, oh, yeah. uh, the way the imagination comes in there. Form, oh yeah. Form, form is your conduit. It is your path. You know, it's, it's, it gives you not just direction, but some sense of boundaries, but also in terms of poetry, which is so important is cadence, measure, you know? Like, you, you really got to hear those words as they roll out, 
you know, and if and and I do this all the time. I mean, I will rearrange words and see how they sound as I say them, you know, because how I think them is not the same as I say them, you know. So, form like yeah, like rhyme. Rhyme can be seen as an obstacle, right? It's it's getting in the way of my expression. Okay, yeah. Free verse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you can see it that way. But also, having to end a line with a word can create the possibility of thinking differently than you would with the comfortable word, with the expected word. You know, it can also do that, which is something that, you know, um, poets have, have have known, you know, for a long time. Uh, but even free verse has its measure. You know, and even a prose poem has a certain kind of rhythm that you have to hear, you know, as the words roll, you know. You have to be very patient as a poet, you know, to, to hear. And you have to spend time with the words, you know, and, and you can't rush them. In the interest know. of covering everything, let me also note that two Two years separate the publication of Wildflowers and Weeds and Orlando's other recent volume, which we are forgetting here, Memoria. Okay. And I, I say in here, and I'm going to be saying in my essay, unless this guy talks me out of it, that <laughs> Memoria, if you read those poems, they are not very rarely religious in any sense. In fact, they evoke at the risk of too strong a word, a rather hedonistic life. Okay. And I suggested to, <laughs> you see, I suggested to Orlando, why is it, why did the poetry of religious transcendence and affirmation compared with this other poem? Pure coincidence? I think not, but my poet may disagree, as he is entitled to do. Right? You know, I think not. I think something's going on here. And yes, I, I deeply appreciate that poetry is a craft, but there is also a thematic going on here as well. See, and I'm, I just I'm pushing this guy a little bit because I really need help with this essay, you know. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, these poems are mostly about Spain. Um, memoria. Memoria, yeah. Um, about the Spain in which I lived as a, as, as a teenager from 73 to 75 during the last two years of the Franco dictatorship. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a great deal of music, rock and roll. You know, I, I mean, I loved rock and roll. I still Pink do. Pink Floyd, I got, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've got, like, these... I've got Japanese mini LP CDs. I've got, like, 2,000 of them. Why does he want to go back to that experience that is sort of out of, out of chronology a bit? Why call it memoria and, and bring it into conjunction with this very religious poetry? I may be asking a full question here, but I'm, I'm, I'm still interested in that conjunction. Well, I mean... Freud. Absolutely. There's, there's this um, quote, I think, if I'm not mis... If I'm not, uh, Sad to say that, but um, that says that when you write about the sexual, you're actually writing about the spiritual, and if you write the spiritual, then you're actually writing about the sexual or sensual. So it's interesting that the two would be within a similar chunk of time, or within a, a, a short period of time, to do both uh, both things. Well, Memoria has a lot of sexual discovery in it. That is true. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I guess that's an outlier book for me. No. Oh, um, oh. <laughs> yeah. My goodness, what luxury for a poet to have an outlier volume. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't really know what to do with it myself. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I really, it's, it's, um, hmm. 
I don't, I don't know what to do with it. I mean, it, it, it is, you know, you, you can have, but I think something that they, they, they share is that the sacred, if misunderstood and mis misapplied, can be oppressive to sexuality. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that is something that Memoria is sort of mm -hmm. aware of, is that, yeah. you know, like, like sin is always some kind of, uh, of course not transcendence, but um, a, what, what's, the, what's the other word? Um, to, um, uh, God almighty, I'm missing out on the word. To, uh, to go against, or something like, what, what's the other word? Trans you've got to... Uh, Contravene? Transgression. Transgression. Yeah. So, so, um, so you, you've, got, you've got that, you know, that feeling something sexual can easily be understood as transgressing, mm -hmm. uh, not just propriety and morality, but, but also the sacred, because, um, I mean, Jesus was not a sexual being. I mean, our Lord was not a sexual being. I mean, there's no mention in Scripture of his sexuality. He's, he's not a sexual being, you know? And the early church was really big on abstinence, you know? So there was always this problem with sexuality. From, from the early moments of the church, you know, which had nothing to do with Judaism. You know, I mean, Judaism doesn't have, doesn't have a problem with sexuality. I mean, in most ways. But, but anyway, um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's that childhood in Lima that made me the Catholic poet. Whoa, what a... What? Yeah. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> yeah. 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 If it ha if it hadn't been born there and raised there, so surrounded by Catholicism, ah, okay. I I wouldn't have had any calling at all. I mean, if I had been born in Cuba and raised in Cuba, forget it. Yeah, forget forget Miami, right? Yeah. Catholic, forget it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Cubans are so lax, you know, in terms of their Catholicism. I mean, they just don't really pay that much attention to it. Uh, I mean, they've always been very lax. But these Peruvians, I mean, they are very devout. I mean, I, I remember the, the procession of our, uh, of our Lord of Miracles in October. That was the month where people would wear these purple habits, you know. And there was this procession that went just by my, this building where I lived mm -hmm. at Tacna y Colmena because the Church of the Nazarenes was very close by. And St. Rose of Lima and St. Martin of Porres very, lived very close. So I, I lived in a city of saints there. So, I mean, the, 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 the fervor that I saw in, in these Peruvians was amazing. And so, and then in the Church of the Nazarenes, you had this uh, altar that had been painted by uh, slaves from Angola in the 1600s, and it had survived multiple earthquakes. And that was a miraculous altar. So I was surrounded by, by these miracles, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Cuba, heck no. It wouldn't have happened. So it was my, my growing up there that got Catholicism into my head. That's right, but it comes back to you later as well yeah, in this yeah. final. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in other poems, I explored Afro-Cuban spirituality, so there, there are many Afrocentric poems. But, but in that spirituality, I mean, there's really no concept of sin 
or fallenness. They, they, it's not part of their belief system. Right. This is supposed to be a Q&A, so uh, anybody jump in or... Yes. Yeah. Rolando, I'm intrigued by your comment about you don't sit down with the notion of what it is you're going to, the poem is going to be. No, not really, no. But clearly the words come to you while you're no. sitting there. Are you yeah. more visual? Or are you more auditory? Or are you more, I mean, are you hearing these things come to you, the words? and? I mean, Both. Both. You know, they, they, they work together. I mean, I, I, term, I tend to think metaphorically a lot. So I, I, I write down lines or metaphors wherever they come up, you know. I, mean, and I like, understand that you're saying eventually you decide to Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I hear, I will hear a line, or I will build the line based on the line before it, you know. Uh, so now I've, I've been writing many more meditations which are much more poems of the mind. Like a stream of consciousness. They can be. They can be. Um, you, you said it's easy. It's not easy. <laughs> I, I, I sat down to write poetry, and no, I, I can't do no, it. No, I mean, you just have to have practice. You know? I mean, if, you, if, you, if you've written a lot of poems, you know, it's not something that you're not you know, comfortable with. I mean, like my father, uh, he was really an upholsterer. He would make furniture. And so I learned craft from him, you know. I learned that sense of labor, right? Yeah, yeah, the labor that a poem is made, you know. Um, it's not, you know, some kind of you know, um, muse that speaks to you, you know, these lines and they kind of descend on you. I mean, yeah, I mean, you can get lines that come to you, but, but then to build from those takes work. I'm trying really hard to be quiet. I can't. So, in response to that question, I recently saw a documentary where they were talking about how language is basically an artifact of synesthesia. You know, where you, you hear colors and you smell sounds and that kind of thing. And I keep thinking that, I think that's, instead of trying to think, okay, there's a direct correlation, you see red and it sparks a memory, that instead it's when you have that, that confusion of senses and that confusion of connections. But, I don't know, if you think that in poetry that's where, where we bring those together, that, that yeah. confusion or, the, or that combination, that chaos yeah. of... Of yeah, yeah, it's messy. I mean, you, you, you get all sorts of, you know, inputs, as, as people would say, you know, and, and I mean, that's pleasurable, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a torture of any kind. But that then raises the question of, of to use your, the analogy with your father about the crafting of things, yeah. right? In what sense can it be said that your father's crafting of things was Latino? And by analogy, in what sense can it be said that the hard work you put into shaping a metaphor or getting the rhythm just right is Latino? In the session earlier, there was a, a lot of talk about Latinidad, you recall, you know, but I didn't hear that, that problem addressed. At the level of form and the shaping of the word and the diction and the rhythm, does that enter into Latinidad in any form or fashion? I don't know. I, 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 I've never thought of it in those terms. You know. What shape did your father see in the wood? to think of what furniture means. I think that parallels what the poet sees in the concept, what shape to make of it, to make a poem. And if you are inhabiting yourself, and yourself is that next, how would not inhabiting yourself 
not then mean that the work itself is that next? I have no idea that's a question or statement. <laughs> Maybe we have a, a different interlocutor here. Okay. So. <laughs> I, I think, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I think that in terms of Latina Dodd and his work, when, he, when you read the essay about all the poems that mention Haiti and Cuba, and those things to me are representative of Latina Dodd. Mm -hmm. So, and I also have a question for you, mm -hmm. and it, it may be. Wrong, but when I read your earlier work um, years ago, I mean, a long time ago, yeah. you you your language was very dense and very tight and very musical. Now, what you read tonight, it seemed more open, mm -hmm. and you know, talking about the spirituality and kind of viewing it as prayer. You I, I think, I think, yeah, I think as I'm, maybe as I'm getting older, I'm just more, I'm just looser. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> I don't know, I guess, I guess when I wrote those first books, I, I, I had to prove, you know, to publishers, I had to prove to the world, you know, like, I can write a poem, you know, I can write a book, you know. But but I don't I don't have that urgency to prove anything now. I don't I don't no. <laughs> if you you know I mean I'm, I'm going to turn sixty five next month. I mean if I have to prove something now, my God. <laughs> you know that would be horrible, right? I mean. You question right here. Well, like earlier you said that uh, prayer requires humility, and to play off of humility, like. It seems that that comes from humiliation in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what you've seen people do with humiliation. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's an interesting relationship between humility and humiliation. Humility is supposed to be good. Humiliation is bad, certainly, right? Um, I mean, humility, humiliation is someone doing it to you, maybe. Humility maybe is doing it to yourself. You know, like I'm not worthy. Is that humility or is it self-flagellation? I don't know. You know. <laughs> how, how do you look at it? You know, um, uh, I yeah. I mean, I, I don't think it's the, the, the it's not a question of you know putting down. It's a question of recognizing, you know, I am not supreme, you know. You know, I, I don't know. It's, maybe it's getting kind of late here. Uh, <laughs> I, I sense we're coming to an end, Francisco. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you all very much for coming out.